The dominant story told about Jeffrey Epstein is one about perversion and privilege. According to the official narrative, Jeffrey Epstein had a penchant for underage girls and was able to get away with trafficking minors because he happened to be wealthy and well-connected. But our guest thinks our guests tonight uh, think that's a simplified and naive account of the relationship between Epstein's crimes and the American and international establishment on their incredibly successful investigative podcast, True and On. Liz Franzak and Brace Belden suggest mainstream coverage is missing some key links uh, in the Epstein story, including between security services and Epstein and his accomplice or alleged accomplice, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. Um, the corporate media could thus be suppressing the most scandalous element of this sordid, of this most sordid of crimes. Liz Brace, welcome to Tisky Sour. Hello. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, we're also joined, of course, by Aaron Bastani. How are you doing, Michael? How are you doing? Get me off. Get you've got two great guests. <laughs> get rid of me. Get, <laughs> me and Aaron in the second half of the show are going to be get talking. To Aaron's, Aaron's going to come in the first half, but in the second half, we're going to be talking about uh, the fundraiser. Uh, for Corbyn's legal fees, which has now raised almost 200k, and you, know, you could say pissed off all the right people, depending on your take. Uh, we're also going to be speaking to Owen Jones live uh, because the far right thugs who attacked him last summer were sentenced today. So we're going to get his his perspective, his take on that. As ever, tweet on the hashtag Tisky Sour, share the show link. Um, before we get on to the first story, um, I want to warn our American comrades that because our establishment is even more twisted, corrupt, perverted, and feudal than your own, our libel laws are actually stricter. They're so fucked up that the, the burden of proof here is on the journalist instead of on the, the perp or the alleged pervert, let's say. But I don't think this will oh, yeah. concern you because I get you, you're, you're, you're good at this shit. You're really good at alleged, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Has anyone yeah, let me just... Preface all of this with everything we're saying here is alleged. Yeah, yeah we're doing yeah. lots of like a hard alleged here. There's, and also yeah. it's our honest opinion. Apparently that's the thing that uh, yes. the, the thing that matters in British law is to say, I, I genuinely believe this. I'm not saying any of this out of malice, um, and no. et cetera, et cetera. But people no, are going nuts about of suing people. Everyone's getting sued at the moment. Just this week in Britain, Jeremy Corbyn's getting sued. It's gone off the um, so how we're going to do this, I'm going to start off by sort of giving an outline of the official narrative, um, as told on the popular Netflix series, Filthy Rich. Mm. Um, and then I'm going to go to Liz and Brace for, you know, where they see the holes as being. So the official narrative. So Jeffrey Epstein is a rich financier who got his wealth by managing money managing the money of the rich and famous. That money and his charm brought his way into elite circles in the United States. Coincidentally, Jeffrey Epstein was also a child sex abuser. He, helped by his friend, Ghislaine Maxwell would pay underage girls to give him massages and have sex with him. Many accuse him of rape. He would traffic these underage girls between various locations, including his Palm Beach mansion and his private island in the Caribbean. Though Epstein's crimes were somewhat of an open secret because of his financial power and social capital, he was able to evade prosecution, apart from one 18-month jail stint in, 20, in 2008. His financial and social connections enabled him to pressure the then, attorney, uh, then state attorney, Alexander Acosta, this is alleged actually, um, to agree an unprecedentedly generous plea deal, which gave both him and his co-conspirators immunity from future prosecution. However, so this is all, this is the injustice that happened, but then it was not until the Me Too movement um, that this impunity would be challenged. So from that point on, secrecy was no longer accepted in these kind of domains. And the, you know, the crimes committed by Epstein and potentially Maxwell were, you know, properly investigated by the state. Um, now, Oh, and, and once that happened, the, the deal, the plea deal, which gives them immunity, was found to be illegal because it didn't keep the, uh, the it didn't consult um, the survivors, the victims. Um, that got thrown out, and that's why he ended up in court. Then allegedly, well, not he he committed suicide is the official story. Well, we'll ask our guests if they believe that one. And now Ghislaine Maxwell is obviously under arrest, and lots of people are worried about what's going to come out. Um, so I want to go to you two about that official narrative. You know, he was. He was a sex offender who happened to be rich enough to get away with it. Where are the holes? 
Liz, you want to you want to go first? Well, I would say that that story isn't wrong. It's just incomplete. And perhaps like the best place to start with where it's incomplete is talking about Jeffrey's background. Now, Jeffrey kind of came out of nowhere. He is a two-time was a two-time college dropout who was hired um, basically when he was a taxi driver to be a uh, school teacher at the Dalton School, which is a very fancy private school on the Upper East Side, very, very wealthy. Um, and But he was hired by a man named Donald Barr, who is the father of current attorney general in America, William Barr. Now, that relationship aside, which is very, um, let's say unique. Uh, you know, Donald Barr is also an ex-OSS agent, the OSS being the precursor to the CIA. So you've got an ex-intelligence agent hiring this man out of nowhere, no college degree, plops him into high society. And from there, he, he gets hired uh, as an investment banker on Wall Street. Now, so this, all of this stuff aside is like, very much missing from the story. Wouldn't you say, Brace? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, the, the fact that, like, I think just the, the fact that Donald Barr's son is now the person who's overseeing basically the investigation into to Epstein uh, post-mortem uh, is is Whoa. astounding. Yeah, exactly. And so there's that, there's, I mean, that's, that's a, it's a very strange shape that makes yeah. there. But 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 just the the intense involvement of people connected to various intelligence agencies basically all down the line here is astounding. I mean, Epstein himself used to tell people that he was something like a bagman for the CIA. That he was he described himself as a financial bounty hunter who would I I guess go get money that was the CIA maybe gave to the wrong warlord or something. It's very unclear what happened there. But but Ghislaine when she enters his life in the early nineties, uh, following the passing of her father, who of course you guys are British. So, you know, Robert Maxwell, um, former labor MP, uh, uh, <laughs> uh former, um, head of a giant media conglomerate there who stole his employees pensions. And of course, famously, allegedly, uh, a spy for the, for the Mossad for Israeli's intelligence services. And, and, uh, and a guy who really liked to sort of play in that world as well, a uh, former member of British Intelligence too during World War II, where he allegedly executed a German uh, officer, which honestly, that's fine with me. But uh, it, it, it's it's so so the daughter of somebody who is who is you know I mean there's a book written about Robert Maxwell calling him Israel's super spy. The daughter of this guy enters Epstein's life in 1991. And, and from there, he really takes off. She introduces him to all kinds of people in high society, right? Because, because Ghislaine, when she was younger, uh, she, you know, she grew up friends with the royal family. Um, she, she, she has a lot of high society contacts. She went to Oxford. She, uh, um, you know, she gets to New York. They, they, the kind of the story there is that she's penniless, but obviously not true. She flew on a damn Concord jet. Um, and and she starts introducing Epstein to people that you know he was rich at this point, um, but that he might not have otherwise known. And and we'd be remiss not to mention too that Epstein's money it is really unclear where it came from. He doesn't seem to have actually worked at all after uh, he was basically given uh, rights to this this American billionaire Leslie Wexter's money, and so. Their relationship continues. Epstein kind of goes further and further up in high society. You know, he's 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 hanging out with the Clintons. Ghislaine's having dinner alone with Bill Clinton in in New York. Um, and, you know, he's 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 meeting basically every kind of rich and famous person you could ever dream of, and uh, he's introducing a lot of them allegedly to very young girls. And another thing about about Jeffrey Epstein, and this has been testified about over and over and over and over again is that all of his properties were wired up with cameras, every single room. Mm, which I and think, so, well, go ahead. I mean, that links to one of the leading theories as well, right? So I just want to, I just want to focus on that money thing just as, as a sort of summary in a way. If, if you watch the Netflix documentary, the story it tells you is that he became one of the richest men in America, essentially by being charming. So yeah. sort of like he didn't get yeah. a degree, but he charmed someone's parent into getting him a job at Bear Stearns. And then at Bear Stearns, he charmed this, yeah, this other 
this guy who owned the clothes firm to sort of give him billions and billions of pounds. And you're sort of watching it thinking, like, fuck, this guy must have been so charming to end up with <laughs> the most valuable townhouse in New yes. York. And the only thing he's got is this sort of, it, it, it doesn't, the story doesn't sound particularly yeah. um, viable to me. Um, but in any case, you just brought up, yeah, there that the, these secret cameras. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the leading theories or the leading alternate theories um, about, Jeffrey Epstein is it's not that he was sort of a, a rogue financier and was let off the hook because he was he was powerful, but his role in the establishment was to sort of involve other elites in these crimes um, and then potentially to film them. So the idea is yeah. it might have been a honey trap either, you know, to personally enrich themselves, to blackmail people after having filmed them doing stuff, or they were working for secret services um, who wanted compromise on, yes. on people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we would, you, you know, a lot of people forget this, but when Jeffrey was, shortly after Jeffrey was arrested, uh, right before his untimely demise in New York, the FBI, when they were raiding his property, they said they found and confiscated uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tapes, what I'm assuming were probably CDs or DVDs or Blu-ray, God knows what, what, what uh, setup he had. But, uh, and they were all labeled, uh, what they say is, you know, person's name, man's name, plus girl's name, right? So, by the way, there has been no mention of where these tapes are or where, um, like, any of that, uh, evidences. No one has even remarked on it since. No one in the media has asked any official about it. Um, we haven't heard anything. But the fact that those exist tells us that those that the tapings or the video tapes uh, that he was accumulating that there was a purpose there. Now you can speculate and say, okay, was it on behalf of someone else? Was it just to kind of cover his bases? Was it kind of a, you know, I think we are of the opinion that it's kind of a mix of both where it's like you keep this because you know what's going on in case you need it later, right? Mm. I, I want to get up a, a headline now, actually, or because it's from, and this is something that I hear you mention on the show is, your, is the way you value tabloids. And I think this sort of leads into an interesting <laughs> discussion about the media. So this is from The Sun. Um, and it says, Ghislaine Maxwell and her pedophile lover, Jeffrey Epstein, were both Israeli spies who took pictures of powerful men having sex with underage girls to blackmail them, their alleged Mossad handler has sensationally claimed. Now, I suppose why uh, the fact that's getting reported in the sun potentially, you know, messes with some of the conspiracy theories, basically, is that the, the conspiracy theory is that the media aren't covering it because they're scared to, um, or, or, or because they're friends with the same people or because they're implicated, et cetera, et cetera. But then why would the sun be able to publish that? Because there is... You know, they're as wound up with the establishment as, as anyone else. So why is it only the tabloids that can put this out there? Because obviously the alternative theory or the, the mainstream theory is the reason the Sun can publish it is because you need less evidence and they can do these sort of salacious scandal stories. So what's your explanation of why the kind of things you investigate on your podcast are more likely to be in a tabloid than the New York Times? Well, uh, with the sun in particular, the sun has, um, we actually did, I think maybe a segment on the show, or maybe I just meant to do a segment on the show about how incorrect the sun was, uh, on so many different points of this. They, at different points within like a four month period said Ghislaine was in an apartment in France. She was in a chateau in France. She was being moved, uh, throughout the Midwest by a crack team of Navy SEALs. And I think like two or three other places. So there's been a lot of misreporting there as well. Um, the sun in particular also is, I believe owned by Rupert Murdoch. Uh, yep. if I'm, if I'm not incorrect, Rupert Murdoch and Ghislaine's father, Robert Maxwell did not get along very mm. well. And maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Um, I think that what the thing is, is like a lot of like serious reporters, um, don't maybe feel comfortable really putting the dots together, or maybe they're told they're not able to put the dots together, or maybe, maybe they're sort of their training. I, which this is sort of the theory that I'm uh, more uh, sympathetic to is that the the train of of a lot of these so-called serious reporters prevents them from from putting this kind of stuff together because they're taught to think of this as the realm of conspiracy theory and that that everything is actually much more simple than it seems and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
that's the most charitable inter interpretation of it I have. Other interpretations, I'm sure people can put put together themselves. Um, but but particularly, we value the tabloids before the Jeffrey Epstein stuff um, grew up. <laughs> like 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 old page six columns. We have taken. Uh, we have learned a lot from them. Um, uh, page six is like a. A, a, a sort of society column in in our, one of our gossip magazines, the New York or tabloid type magazines, the New York Post, because um, that will report a lot of stuff like the fact that Ghislaine was was seen having having dinner um, with 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 Bill Clinton in in New York City. Um, it's yeah, uh, it's uh, we take it. We, we learn a lot from that kind of stuff. I think too, like, you know, we should, you know, remind people that, I mean, I don't know if they're aware of this in the UK. I think it made a splash over there, but um, there was a leaked video that came out of a American news anchor, Amy Robach. Uh, it was like, a, she was caught on a hot mic, basically. Mm -hmm. I love saying that hot mic um, where she was saying that she had the Epstein story back in spring of 2015 and that, she had everything. She had the accusers. Um, she had everything. You know, they implicated some very powerful people. She mentions Bill Clinton. I believe she mentions, I believe she mentions in the video Prince Andrew. She does. Um, and you know, she said that it got completely shut down by the network. And we should remember that, you know, what was happening in America and the UK in spring 2015. Okay, well. We were months out from Hillary Clinton announcing her candidacy for presidency, for the presidency, and there was a royal baby about to be born. And so you've got two very powerful, you know, political families in their own right, in different respects, that have the ability to withhold access on major stories in order to get the mainstream press, as we would call it, not to cover stuff. And that's something that literally, like, literally happened. Now, do I know if those conversations happened? No, I don't know. I'm speculating. But I think you can kind of line up some things where you've got, you've got a case that implicates some very, very powerful people. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why those people want to keep it out of outlets that normal, everyday, you know, Americans or, you know, any, you know, any population would find reputable. It's easy to dismiss the tabloids. Oh, it's the sun. Who cares? Oh, it's New York Post. It's gossip. It's harder to discredit ABC News or the New York Times or the Washington Post. I want to, I'm glad you brought up Prince Andrew because he's my next mm. uh, piece of oh, yeah. evidence I'm going to bring. Or, or the next, uh, the, the next piece of my argument. He, he's, he's presented me with an argument as to why the deep state can't be involved. Um, before we show <laughs> this clip, uh, we've oh, got over 2,000 people watching. Um, let's get more people watching tonight. You're, you're seeing insight you're not going to see on the BBC tonight on Navarro Media. So, so do make sure to get your friends watching. Um, this is Prince Andrew. Let's take a look. One of Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yeah. has made allegations against you. She was very specific about that night. Mm -hmm. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating. <laughs> And that she went on to have bath, there's a, there's possibly. A, there's a slight problem with 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 with, with the sweating um, because uh, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat, um, or I didn't sweat at the time, and that was oh, she, yes, I didn't sweat at the time because I um, ha had suffered what I would describe as an overdose of adrenaline in the Falklands War when I was shot at. Uh, and I simply, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost impossible for me to, to, to sweat. Do you remember dancing at Tramp? No. That couldn't have happened because the date that there's being suggested, I was at home with the children. You know that you were at home with the children? Mm. Was it a memorable night? On that particular day that, that, that um, uh, uh, we now understand is the date, which is the 10th of March, uh, I was at home. Uh, I was with the children. I'd taken Beatrice to uh, a Pizza Express in Woking for a party at, a, I suppose, sort of four or five in the afternoon. Why would you remember that so specifically? Why would you remember a, a Pizza Express birthday and being at home? Because 
Going to Pizza Express in Woking is an unusual thing for me to do. A very unusual thing for me to do. I've never been, I've only been to Woking a couple of times um, and I remember it weirdly distinctly. As soon as somebody reminded me of it, I went, oh yes, I remember that. So uh, I'll, explain, I'll explain why that for me is evidence. Well, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting on the fence here, but why it could be evidence that Deep State is not involved. Because presumably, if this was a big cover-up that they don't want to unravel, they'd give him some good lines. And you can say a bunch of things about the CIA, the MI5, whatever, Mossad. Are they that dumb? That he'd say, how, how, do I, how do I stop this all unraveling? And they say, you couldn't sweat because of the Falklands War. And then you went to Pizza Express when you were supposed to be having sex <laughs> with an underage minor. I forgot about the Pizza Express line. I always remember the sweat, but the Pizza Express one is like the real Classic. cherry on top. I think a couple of things about that. I would say that, um, you know, I would push back on the idea that there is like one single, like single subject that's driving like something here where there, it's like one body that's controlling and manipulating all of these moving parts. I don't think that's true. But I also think that, you know, and I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but I don't think Prince Andrew is perhaps, um, you know, maybe the sharpest tool in the box. And I would imagine that, you know, they know, okay, well, he's already pretty well implicated. And there is quite possibly some documents coming out next week that might as well, that might uh, implicate him even further, which we can get to. But, um, you know, in the same way that they kind of like let him, like kind of cut him loose. Because the other thing to remember here too, is that like the United States is never going to, like, like the United States is never gonna indict Prince Andrew on any, like that. that is out of the realm of possibility. Like it would be uh, completely unheard of for the United States government to indict a, a member of the royal family. Like it's just not going to happen. And so, like, I think that you know his uh, you know clearly very bad PR team aside, like the sweat argument and the Pizza Express. It's really like you know shocking they couldn't come up with like a better. Any and literally any other excuses, but um, I, you know, I, I don't. I, I could see them saying, "Well, let's just see if we can run this out a little bit, maybe." Mm -hmm. I mean, also, I suppose, sort of like uh, what you talk about on the podcast. It's not, you know, people can be involved in a different way, right? So, in a way, he was obviously an incredibly unsympathetic. He, well, he's both well, allegedly an abuser, but also potentially a victim of a wider program to get compromise. and if yeah. you want to compromise you'd want it off someone who was both in a position of incredible privilege and incredibly stupid and so yeah. to get a sort of hereditary royal um <laughs> and who, he seems to be the dumbest hereditary royal that would make sense <laughs> emphasis on on hereditary royal right there because there's some he's got a strange sort of look a uh, neo Habsburgian look to him <laughs> uh, but yeah that, really that, that no, interview is, is the greatest, uh, one of the greatest pieces of film since Sallow. It's incredible. <laughs> I really uh, can't get over the sweating. I mean, this, the I didn't sweat that back at the time because of PTSD from the Falklands. I mean, no offense, but from the Falklands War, it's like, you know. Let's yeah. go on to um, what's, what's next in the, like what we can look forward to if we're watching this, this particular case. Um, so at the moment, obviously, this is in the news because Ghislaine Maxwell is now in custody. Um, and we're presuming there are some very powerful people who are pretty nervous um, about what is going to come next. One of them um, is potentially Donald Trump because they've been pictured together. Um, he was asked about this at a press conference this Tuesday. Let's take a look. Ms. Lane Maxwell is in prison, and so a lot of people want to know if she's going to turn in powerful people. And I know you've talked in the past about Prince Andrew, and uh, you've criticized Bill Clinton's behavior. I'm wondering, uh, do you feel that she's going to turn in powerful men? How do you see that working out? I don't know. I haven't really been following it too much. I just wish her well, frankly. Uh, I've met her numerous times over the years, especially since I lived in Palm Beach, and I guess they lived in Palm Beach. Uh, but I wish her well, whatever it is. Uh, I don't know the situation with Prince Andrew. Just don't know. I'm not aware of it. <laughs> it's like he, he employed the same PR firm as Prince Andrew. <laughs> Very bizarre answer. 
what, what's gonna what do you think is gonna come out though of this she's got a book right she's got has she got videos cds i think there were tabloids reporting that she's got well she's now sort of talking about the fact that she's got pictures and videos of high profile people with what, what what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks are we going to get a big revelatory moment or is it going to be a bit of a damp squib well, I, I think I think any revelations we're going to get are probably going to come out of the unsealed depositions or the, the depositions that are being unsealed within this um, this next week. I I a lot of the tabloid reporting on like she has these DVDs or whatever. I mean, if you look at the actual people they're sourcing them from, they are not the most credible characters in the world. So I, I you know I I would I would well I don't want it to be true because I want it to not have happened. But you know I I, I if that is true, we'll see. I, I, you know, I'm going to wait until they actually come out, which oddly enough, it'll, I don't know. It's the legality of actually viewing those kind of things might be very gray. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think a lot of stuff is going to come out in the next week, just basically in relation to the court case, but not necessarily from Ghislaine herself. She seemed pretty surprised to be actually picked up in the first place. Liz and I were, were present on, uh, on, on her bail sentencing call and, uh, and she did not seem overly prepared for what's happening right now, which, I mean, that could be for a variety of reasons. The trial is actually set for a year from now. So, mm -hmm. you know, in that time, they got to do discovery and they got to, you know, collect evidence and present to the judge, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure how much we'll find out in that time. Hopefully there will be more stuff that comes out. Um, but I would be shocked if she did not have some sort of, dead man switch or something. Although from her behavior so far, it doesn't seem like she might be totally ready to push that. And it may not be time to sort of push that button. Mm. Yeah, we should say about the documents being released next week. It should be by the end of next week. They are related to a civil case uh, that was filed in 2015 by Virginia Jeffrey, who also we should say is the accuser of Prince Andrew. And this is a civil case against Gillian Maxwell, herself. Um, and so it looks like what will be released will be the both depositions by Virginia and by Ghislaine in relation to that case. Now it's unclear if their names will be, if like people that are named in the documents, if they'll keep those names redacted. But the good news is that the judge that ruled in that in favor of uh, Virginia in the civil case of releasing these documents did so um, uh, basically uh, citing public interest as a, as opposed to privacy or, or any kind of like privacy claims. So it's setting a good precedent, at least in the US, for like further documents being unsealed, um, whether they're in civil cases or in relation to um, even the Epstein, uh, the, the Florida Epstein case before his um, arrest last year. I also wanted to ask some sort of general questions about conspiracies and conspiracy mm. theories, because obviously, you know, the title of your show is is a play on QAnon. Um, to be honest, I, I'm kind of new to this theory. But, so this is that the, uh, there's a bunch of liberal Hollywood actors, Democratic politicians and high ranking officials. <laughs> They're all members of an international child sex trafficking ring. Um, and they've also claimed that Donald Trump feigned collusion with Russians to enlist Robert Mueller to join him in exposing the ring oh, and yeah, preventing yeah. a coup d'etat by yeah. Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and George Soros. Yes. Uh, so, do you do, do you think that the are you called True Anon because you're you know you deal in the truth and Q Anon deal in fantasy? Is that how you see the relationship? Well, we actually just did an episode uh, with 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 friend of the show Robbie Martin, I think last week about how Q Anon and and it's it's a sort of precedent in Pizzagate have some extremely weird roots uh, to them that are, that are seem to stem from an area very cl close to Donald Trump. Not to say that Q himself is, is real and the conspiracy theory is real, but the conspiracy theory might be propagated by real people who are actually might be connected to the administration, like Eric Prince, uh, uh, et, et cetera. Um, but, but yeah, uh, we think our stuff's true. Their stuff's <laughs> fake. I mean, the thing is, the allegedly is, true, I suppose. Allegedly true. Yeah. There the thing is, is 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 with QAnon and with this stuff, is there are like there are kernels of truth to it. Like there does seem to be a a international uh uh you know elite pedophile ring that that is probably you know stretches around the globe around the globe. Uh I just don't think that Donald Trump isn't in it. Allegedly, like I don't I don't know. I, 
I, I shouldn't say pedophile, but like, you know, I, I can't really be sold that Donald Trump is the person who is busting this, especially considering, you know, his friendship with these people and, uh, you know, his general uh, lackadaisical attitude when it comes to uh, sexual exploitation to begin with. Um, so, yeah. I, I also, I don't think I, I dislike Hillary Clinton very much. I'm not sold on the fact that she ate a baby, which is a big part of the QAnon mythos. You know, if I could see the Frazzle Drip video, okay, you can convince me. But I'm not just going to take your word for it that she ate a baby. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, we should say that when we started the podcast, we were like, huh, this is a funny goof. And then the podcast got really big. And now suddenly we have to be like, uh, yeah, oops, sorry about that, guys. But at least it's catchy. I don't yeah, know. It is catchy. It's a great name. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean... We should say that like at the heart of all like quote unquote conspiracy theories are like real grains of truth. Like we do know that the CIA, you know, and MI6 and, you know, various intelligence agencies across the world for, you know, better half of the 20th century, we're moving money, we're running drugs, we're, we're you know, infiltrating communist left wing movements um and you know overthrowing popularly elected leaders like we know that exists like that's all real and like so for i think for us like the bigger project is saying okay well here's all this stuff kind of in the popular imaginary and these are the stories that people are kind of i think too especially in 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 you know a time where a lot of people are becoming new to left politics a lot of this history particularly in america is really not told um, that it's a way for us to kind of grab onto these things and say, okay, yeah, this is all sensational. This is all crazy, allegedly, but actually there is a real, you know, history here that actually is really important to take seriously from a left political perspective, you know, like, for example, we, we talk a lot about post-World War II and the way the Nazis were moved through the rat lines into South America and how that, um, coincides with American projects to stymie any kind of uh, socialist or communist project there, right? Like these are important stories to tell that all kind of map onto what in a lot of popular imagination would be called conspiracy theory, but like actually aren't. Mm. And you could also say, and I mean, I, I see it a lot, to be honest, that this idea of delegitimizing conspiracy theories is one tool of maintaining power right because you're saying to even yeah, to even absolutely. suggest this to even follow these leads you are committing a conspiracy theory and then also i mean because we've got our own have you have you looked into like our westminster alleged pedophile wings, wings. oh god one <laughs> oh you need to look into them they're fucked That's no like i know no we mean there's yeah, too no, many like, to look into. there's a lot <laughs> we, we we've done we've done some i yeah, think earlier yeah. episodes uh where, where we touched on that stuff the thing is too the link is so, you know, Jimmy Savile famously uh, did a lot of things, but one of his things he did in, in the, the morgues that he went into, allegedly, I don't, I, I don't think he's, he's dead now. Anymore. He can't libel he, you. He, he you took the him. eyes, he took eyes, glass eyes out of bodies. Epstein in his hallway had uh, 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 like the, the entire decoration of this hallway in his mansion was filled with glass eyes taken from morgues in Britain. Obviously not the same ones, but, those sort of synchronicities there really uh, that that attracts me a lot. I knew that I knew the eye thing about Epstein's house from your podcast. Actually, I did not make that connection. That is revelatory. Sick, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sick. Uh, I don't know got... what it means. There's a lot of this stuff. I don't know what it means. It might. It probably doesn't mean anything. But as a strict Jungian, I have to note the synchronicities <laughs> here. I think maybe it's. I mean, I suppose my theory when I'm being you know quite abstract about it is is. I think the ritual, the having information on each other, it is part of wedding the establishment together, building trust, mm, yeah. building reliance. Absolutely. So I can see why, you know, Freemasonry, it was a thing, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. Well, my producer's telling me to move on because we've got um, Owen Jones on the line. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on, an absolute revelation. I'm going to go to a comment first from Babs uh, on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Glad I didn't bother with the Netflix Epstein doc if it's BS getting the real tea on hashtag Tisky Sour at Navarra Media. Wonder how Epstein got his money then. If you want to find out the answer to that question, don't watch the Netflix documentary. Listen to the last 83 episodes of the True Anon podcast. 
Uh, that is all the information you are going to need on this story, all the alleged information you're going <laughs> to need on this story. Uh, thank you both um, so much for joining me tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. Liz, Brace, I hope we'll get you back on soon as this story develops. Yeah, thank thanks. you so much. Thanks for having us. <laughs> um, that was great. Um, we are going to go, we're going to bring Owen in in a moment, but first of all, let's get Aaron back. Michael. What did you make of that? Great. I thought they were two fantastic guests. And I think that the, the point about conspiracy theories, um, particularly in the context of the Cold War, is a really, really, really important one. You know, there are so many underexamined, untold stories. Uh, you know, I was researching something called Unit 731. Ever heard of that? No, I haven't. Unit 731 was the biological and chemical weapons unit of the Imperial Japanese Army. Uh, not a single scientist captured by the United States government was ever tried. They were all given immunity and they went to work for the United States on their chemical and biological weapons programs after the war. Uh, the ones captured by uh, the Russian army, uh, face trial, uh, went to labor camps. Just amazing stories like this. And you just you just uh, you think, well, who's going to tell them? You know, that's why you need to support media like True and On, like Navarro Media, uh, because over the next five, 10 years, you, we do have a really big job, I think, to get these amazing stories out there. And it, it begs the question, actually, you know, just from a, a business perspective, why isn't a story like 731 talked about more frequently? Uh, why isn't, for instance, the True and On podcast, the way it's being told so forensically, the Epstein story? You know, that, that's good journalism. Why is that not more frequently happening? It's, it's not because there isn't an audience for it. There are huge audiences for these stories. Well, people spike them and people get killed. Yeah, I mean, it, it you know, there it's, I mean, that that's they're conspiracies to themselves, but it does, you know, there are consequences often for investigating the crimes of powerful people. Um, we're going to go on to our next story. There was also a good a good link in there if you want to support independent journalism. Um, I'm hoping we won't need bodyguards. I just like if anyone from the deep state is watching, I'm too lazy to find out and get proof for all the crimes you may have committed. So leave me alone. Um, I'm safe. And go to navarramedia.com forward slash support, not if you're in the secret services, although your money is welcome, whoever you are. Um, but I'm talking more to our committed Tisky Sour audience. The far-right hooligans who assaulted Owen Jones last August in an unprovoked attack have today been sentenced. The incident took place at 2 a.m. outside a North London pub where Owen had been celebrating his birthday with friends. Uh, from the reporting of the case, it seems lucky he was with friends. Um, I'd gone home by that point. Um, James Healy from Portsmouth, who had at least nine convictions relating to football hooliganism stretching back to 1998, was sentenced to two years and eight months in jail today. And The Guardian had these details on the judgment made of Healy. Let's get these up. So the judge described Healy as a man holding extreme right-wing opinions who attacked a victim who did no more than hold opinions on which the defendant did not agree. And then we got some quotes from the prosecution led by Philip McGee. McGee prosecuting said Healy possessed a greeting card which bore Nazi far-right extremist terror symbols, including those associated with the far-right Combat 18 group, one of whose tenets is kill all queers. Also discovered was a Nazi SS flag bearing a Totenkopf, death's head skull symbol, plus a number of pin badges, including a circular pin badge with the lead the way and whatever it takes motto of combat 18 and a badge that says Chelsea, Chelsea FC, no asylum seekers, completely gross stuff. Um, the two other men who took part in the attack were also sentenced and they were Liam Tracy, 35 from Camden and Charlie Ambrose, 31 from Brighton, both received an eight month sentence suspended um, for two years. I'm joined by Owen Jones now. Hi, Owen. Hello. Um, how do you how how do you feel about the the sentences? Are they strong enough? Um, I don't see prison as a solution to far right extremism. It, it isn't a solution to fascism. Fascism, the far right, are political problems. They're not judicial problems. They can't be defeated by custodial sentences. Um, we can't just treat this as thuggery uh, out on the streets. Obviously, there was a political context uh, to the attack. So I suppose, I mean, look, I'm not going to start camping outside prison going free James Healy, the Nazi one. Um, we have a prison system which disproportionately locks up uh, people who are poor with mental distress, people who are of colour, people who are imprisoned because of the war on drugs. Um, my wider point, though, is, you know, this shouldn't be a focus on, on, on me. Um, this was in my own case, certainly uh, just the most extreme example of a 
pretty relentless far right campaign in terms of being uh, on the streets, um, harassed, uh, repeated attempted assaults, lots of death threats, harassed whilst doing my job, uh, including on air. Um, but we've got to remember that 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 there are those from minorities as well as on the left who are targeted by the far right who don't have my profile in the media as a white guy um and there are people from minorities uh who are being targeted uh, harassed abused and indeed attacked and worse people have gone through far far worse than i have and don't get this attention or coverage so if we think about this was judged to be a homophobic crime as well as a far right crime uh, homophobic crimes have surged reported uh, hate crimes have surged by half in five years transphobic hate crimes but have trebled that's the tip of the iceberg the vast majority of hate crimes are not reported um, and similarly there's been a surge in racist hate crimes hate crimes which are categorized as motivated by religion uh, islamophobic hate crimes anti-semitic hate crimes they have all surged and we do need to have that focus, not on me as this white columnist at The Guardian who was uh, attacked by someone with quite an extensive collection of Nazi memorabilia uh, in his house. But we've got to broaden this out. And the reason that's important is, far, you know, when we, t we have a discussion in the mainstream media, who radicalizes Islamist extremists? We talk about hate preachers and who they happen to be. In the case of the far right in this country, those hate preachers have mainstream platforms in the media, entire media outlets, mainstream politicians who have whipped up bigotry and hatred against Muslims and other minorities and who have vilified the left as terrorist, loving, Britain hating, dangerous extremists. Actions have consequences. And just one other example, during the election, remember that supposed punching of a conservative advisor, which never happened, which several broadcast journalists amplify before then deleting uh, with often pretty mediocre apologies to accompany them. Did we hear, how many of you, be honest, how many of you heard about the two Labour activists, both in their 70s, one of whom, they were both beaten up during canvassing, one of whom uh, had alleged, uh, well, had apparent broken ribs as a consequence, a woman in her 70s. How many of you have heard of that attack? I would say very few. And the truth is the left are constantly demonized and portrayed as an abusive rabble, often because of mean tweets. We hear about cancel culture because of celebrities often being criticized online. But when you get an actual far right threat, which has killed in this country, which has attempted to kill, which has been responsible for terrorist plots and which has violently assaulted people worse than myself, it just shows, doesn't it, that the lack of focus on this menace uh, and and the threat it poses to minorities and the left, instead just this focus on vilifying the left, which has fueled this this in the first place. I think Aaron's going to come in. Yeah, solidarity, Owen. Um, I just want to say you've dealt with it with real dignity. Uh, people saying that on online and so on, but I just want to say it to your face. I think it's really commendable how you still articulate. I think a very progressive politics around you know rehabilitation, deterrence, retribution, and so on. W what's the solution? So you, you've said that you don't think you know far right activism activists. This kind of very toxic politics, we all agree on that. Uh, the solution isn't sending people to prison. What, so what is the solution? If if everybody was to do what you think is the, is the right thing, how do we go about changing this and making sure this doesn't happen? Well, we do, look, it, 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 in the broadest sense, obviously, I just this system doesn't rehabilitate. I do think that, it's, you know, we do need, when it comes to the far right, to organise in our communities, to organise on the streets, uh, to, and also to challenge... Uh, the those who are complicit in radicalizing the far right, and that, as I've said, is in the mainstream media and and within the political elites, and to deal with often uh, the despair and misery of a broken economic system that far right extremists feed upon. But equally, of course, we have to invest in rehabilitating, and you can do that with far right extremists as well. I don't want James Healy to spend the rest of his life being this far right thuggish loser. I think it's tragic. In a, what's happened to him? He uh, obviously was so full of hatred because I'm gay and because of my political opinions that in one moment he launched this attack and now has to pay with a prison sentence, which is very earliest will have him being released November 2021. Didn't have to do that. What, what's led him to this path? I mean, obviously he's got quite extensive violent history, 
But obviously, you know, I'm not being all wishy-washy. Fascism needs to be confronted and defeated and to be responsible when in power for tens of millions of deaths and across the world over the last few years, several terrorist attacks which have killed huge numbers of Jews, Muslims, and other minority, and black people, Latinx, and, and many others. Um, so I'm not being all wishy-washy, liberal, kind of let's all sit around singing kumbaya. But equally, you've got we've got to have a strategy, to, you know, when, when extremists like this... In the same way we talk about other violent offences to invest in rehabilitation and de-radicalisation. We don't do that in this country. And actually, if you look at the prison system at the moment, where often radicalisation takes place, we get people being radicalised with far-right extremist and Islamist extremism within the prison complex. There is a danger. I don't think James Healy, no offence to him, I mean, he's having a torrid time as it is, is bright enough to go around radicalising the British prison population. But, you know, he could be even more radicalised in the prison system. So we need to invest in actually doing that. I mean, there was this case, the London Bridge attack last year. Remember when, a horrific attack, uh, when uh, two people who worked in rehabilitation to young people were, were attacked by Islamist extremists. Apparently in the years he'd previously been in prison, he had like a few hours invested in de-radicalisation. So far. So I think we need to invest in that. I would prefer James Healy, you know, I don't, instead of being locked up, if he was actually thrown into an intensive rehabilitation uh, system, I would prefer that just doesn't exist. Finally, do, do you think there's a danger this is going to become a free speech issue? I'll, sort of, I'll clarify what I mean. So you sort of alluded already to the idea that you know there are people, well, liberal from the, from across the political spectrum, I suppose, who who've re written these open letters talking about how um, the climate, especially on social media, people judging what they're saying has has inhibited people's ability to speak freely about stuff. Um, they're normally talking about you know condemnation in Twitter replies. Do you think that the threat of far-right attacks is at a point whereby people are going to start self-censoring because they don't want to you know, put themselves in the firing line? Well, that is a danger. And I worry as well that people would draw that conclusion from my own experience. And I've, I've been very clear, and I said this to my you know, friends and people who are close to me who, uh, fair enough, often get concerned, and they should be concerned as well for themselves because... You know, I, I wasn't just attacked that evening. You know, three others defending me were also punched in the head. Uh, so unfortunately, I've become a, a threat, including to to you guys. If you, when, the next time we go for a drink, there's always that threat lingering in the air. Sorry about that. Um, but I think, you know, it's very important, firstly, that, you know, I would never let them live in my head. I didn't feel scared whilst I was being attacked, it's like your thing to say. Never going to be scared by these people. Never going to be intimidated. But that is a danger. There's no right way to spot well there's not there's there's lots of wrong ways uh, sorry there's lots of different ways you could respond to this and it's understandable if people were attacked that they start to sell censor but they are winning fascists if they do that and the reason i've been frustrated with the so-called cancel culture debate you know there's a times article the other week which put together lots of random different phenomena under the bracket can cancel culture they included r kelly r kelly is an alleged pedophile and someone who allegedly sexually assaulted young women. Uh, that was thrown in to a couple of actors who got criticised on Twitter. Now, if a term is being used to, to, to describe someone who is currently going through the justice system for alleged paedophilia and people who have got some Twitter mentions which are critical of something they have done, I think that term is redundant. But what is very striking is... Whilst we've heard J.K. Rowling using a very, very big platform to say things which undoubtedly impact on a marginalised uh, community. And I will use my words carefully there because J.K. Rowling, of course, signed that letter on free speech a couple of weeks ago and has now sued a kid's website uh, for the way it described her comments on trans people and trans rights. Um, so it just shows the hypocrisy of the whole thing. Um, but at the same time, what is, it is striking that we hear a lot about, oh, no, you know, people can't say anything and they're being shut down because people are criticising them online. Whilst I'm not getting a violin out, but this violent attack was just one of repeated, you know, people can see the videos online of me being harassed and targeted by far extremists whilst doing my jobs. Ash Sarka of Navarra fame of this parish, she herself has been repeatedly vicious, uh, viciously attacked by far extremists who hate the fact that she's a woman of colour who's a million times more intelligent than them, uh, an articulate fighter for justice uh, for people who don't have a voice, who terrorise her, try to terrorise her, uh, including when she posted a picture of an orange lice lolly 
and three oranges reflecting her orange bike handles uh, and a bike seat, um, trying to claim that she was glorifying the uh, terrorist, alleged terrorist attack against three gay men in Reading. Uh, and then she got a load of death threats and violent threats. They are trying to hound us out of public life. And the other point, it is important to make, it winds people up of a certain type, but it is the lived experience of me and others, and I'm not going to airbrush it, is it is true that I talked about how far right, well, mainstream right-wing commentators and politicians help radicalise these people. And that is undoubtedly the case. When they speak of saboteurs and traitors uh, and, and call the left terrorist-loving, Britain-hating, dangerous extremists, when they do all of that, they're playing with fire. But what about some people, and no, not all, but some people who call themselves moderates and centrists, who use both sides' rhetoric, who essentially call the, the left in a quite a broad term, in a broad definition, as just as bad as the far right, which is Trump-style both sidesism, but in practice reserve far much more attention and bile for the left. And I find, and Ash gets this, and others get this as well, often when I'm attacked in inflammatory ways by these so-called, this grouping of, of, of so-called moderates, they're often being retweeted by fascists. And I just don't know if those people look at that and realise or, or consider that might be a slight problem. Because it's I'm not saying, by the way, oh, you can't criticise the left. I don't think that's ever going to stop. And that happens on a daily basis. And of course, that scrutiny and debate should happen. But when you get some people who call themselves moderate, who have utterly vilified and become obsessed with vilifying the left, uh, and we can see that playing out this week in lots of different ways, they were driven out of public life, and are using quite extreme and inflammatory language to do so, they are mainstreaming or, or legitimizing far more extreme elements who take their cue and go, well, even these so-called moderate people hate these people, which means these people are fair game, and they've got a massive target on their heads. And I would say to those people, you are playing with fire, and from whatever happens from here on in, not just to myself, but to others, in terms of what we now have to face as a consequence of the existence of far-right extremists, if you are fueling that radicalization against the left, the attempt to delegitimize the left as an acceptable, legitimate political force in Britain, you are helping to radicalize these extreme elements. And that's not just right-wing commentators and politicians. It's some people who regard themselves as far more moderate, indeed, some who, who are in the Labour Party itself. And there's nothing I can do to make them stop it, but they should be aware of it. And for whatever happens from here on in, there needs to be a public record because it is a reality that can't be ignored. Owen Jones, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And we'll let you get on with the rest of your night. But solidarity from me and all of us at Navarra, Hello. as always. You see. Um, Lots of love. Um, let's go to a comment. Mark Longley tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. There were times when out leafleting for Adam Freeman as part of South Staffordshire CLP's campaign in November. I didn't feel safe. The question is, how do we stop the narrative that Corbynites and the left are destroying British culture? And we might return to that question sort of in general at the end. But actually, I think it links quite well um, to our next story, which in a way is sort of shows the the desperation in a way of Corbynites to clear their name. Um, before we do that, if you're watching and you haven't already, hit the like button. It helps us on the algorithm. A crowdfunding campaign has been launched to raise legal defense funds for Jeremy Corbyn and has raised tens of thousands of pounds within days. Um, so the context we mentioned on Wednesday. So the Labour Party have apologized um, and I suppose admitted or accepted um, that they libeled ex-staffers when they said that they were or well, they implied that they were bad faith actors. I can't remember exactly what was in the statement, but basically they were in a panorama documentary saying that the Labour Party was anti-Semitic, basically. The party responded by saying, we think these people are probably politically motivated and parts of their story don't stack up. What happened on Wednesday, the party said, oh, actually, no, we were completely wrong. Um, you, you were brilliant workers and we should never have said this. We apologise wholeheartedly, paid them a bunch of money. Um, now, Corbyn, what Corbyn did is on Wednesday, he tweeted out sort of saying, I'm not sure about this, actually. I feel like um, the party was given legal advice, or he says the party was given legal advice or suggestion that it could win this case. And also many of the things that went out in that original, you know, Labour Party document, Labour Party statement, you know, don't seem that far from the truth. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing here. What has happened is since then, 
Um, John Ware, the documentary maker who made that program, has suggested he's going to bring a case um, against Jeremy Corbyn. And yeah, this crowdfunder is completely blown up. So within 24 hours, it had £100,000 in it. Um, let's take a look at how much it's on now. Um, can we get it up? I don't know how, what, what it's on now. It's on about 180 when the show started. So we can see if, how, how much further it's gone since then. Uh, it's on 188. So nearly 200k. So you can see there is a massive demand um, to well fund this, I suppose it's unconfirmed campaign, as it were. Now you've seen lots of people on Twitter say, you know, the, we've got homelessness, we've got um, people using food banks, how could people donate money to Corbyn's legal fund, who's already an MP with a decent salary instead of all of these charities? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll see what Aaron's take on this, but personally, I think that completely misses the point. Um, I don't think the people who are donating to this fund worry that Corbyn is going to get be made bankrupt. You know, I, I think the people who have donated this to this fund are in a way kind of encouraging him to take this on. Um, because I feel like many people feel a bit let down by the fact that the Labour Party conceded that case. So we'll never get a judgment from a from a judge on whether or not libel was committed, whether or not what was said in that Labour Party statement about these people having political gripes and you know some of the stories not stacking up, that will never get judged on because the Labour Party has conceded. And I think what members quite want to see um, is, is Corbyn take this to court? Well, I mean, it would someone would need to now sue him personally for libel. But I mean, people want to see a, a conclusion here because the assumption, not the assumption, because I, I mean, I think there's lots of evidence for it, is that the... The dominant narrative that's being created here is not a just one. We have a, a mainstream media that is not interested in covering any kind of fact or any kind of evidence that complicates their narrative. For example, James Schneider saying that he um, had texted one of the so-called whistleblowers asking them to deal quickly with a Holocaust denier and that so-called whistleblower didn't do anything about it for months and then appeared on a TV show saying, you know, I was always pressured to go easy on people. Um, or something to that effect. Obviously, I don't know the word. I don't know the sentences on the documentary off by heart. And I know there are lots of litigious people in this country at the moment. But anyway, I'm going to go to you, Aaron, for your take on this particular story. Yeah, I couldn't really believe it, to be honest. I mean, look, people can give their money to what the hell they like. And where does that logic end? Oh, there are there are food banks. People are starving. OK, then don't buy any new clothes this year. OK, don't go on any holidays the next five years. Give Give all of it to a food bank. Nobody thinks like that. If people want to give their money freely and voluntarily uh, in order to pursue justice uh, and maintain the good name of somebody who they believe to be in the right, wh wh where's the problem with that? I, I don't get it. And it does speak to a very strange authoritarianism amongst Labour moderates. I mean, I, I would never dream of telling people how they can spend their money. It just seems bizarre to me. But this kind of this censorious, you know, prudishness how dare you could... and it's not just a few minor people on twitter by the way you've got rosie duffield liking tweets tweeting about it you're an mp for christ's sake or grow, grow up you know if a 10 year old was telling somebody how to spend their money i'd say can you please stop it you know that isn't for you to say she's a grown adult with children it really speaks again like i say to a very latent authoritarianism within that genre of politics i mean it's also i think evident of a tendency you know among many labor mps or people in the labor establishment to punch left Right, yeah. Because obviously, donating to this crowdfunder campaign and donating to a food bank is not a zero-sum game. I'm sure many people who donated to this crowdfunder also did that. But it's probably a correlation, about, right? There's probably yeah, a significant correlation. Probably, yeah. But but talking about, you know, it's, it's because people are donating, you know, the implication that less people are getting money in homeless shelters because these people wanted to donate to... Jeremy Corbyn's legal crowdfunder campaign. We should also be clear, actually, it's not. this wasn't started by Jeremy Corbyn. It was started by a, a grassroots member who wanted to put together a, a fund. He sort of implied his endorsement of it with a couple of tweets, but he hasn't. there's no, there's no official explicit connection. I mean, he might not need uh, it, right? He might yeah. not be good. But the, uh, I suppose to finish the point about punching left, this week we learned that... Um, oh, I was about to call him Elon Musk. I've had a complete brain freeze. Amazon owner. Jeff Bezos. What went on there? Jeff Bezos earned 10 billion pounds in one day because of the share price of Amazon rising because everyone's getting things delivered during coronavirus. Now, the idea, if you if you look at homelessness and you think that one of the problems here is that people are donating, is that working class people are donating to try and defend a politician who they think is an honest man, who they think has been treated unfairly. And you think there's a zero sum game between that and 
homeless shelters, I suggest you direct your attention towards the guy who just made 10 billion pounds in one day. And it does fit into this broader pattern of people who are constantly wishing to, you know, nitpick at the, the various decisions that ordinary working people who happen to be left wing have made, and mm. then, you know, completely find it unremarkable um, that someone who pays his workers really badly, um, and, you know, owners owns a fairly monopolistic business has earned 10 billion pounds in one day it's like where are your priorities here it, it just doesn't sit right with me and i think as well as what it boils down to i think effectively for me is the fact that he remains quite popular you know it's one thing to get 100 and almost hundred ninety thousand pounds i'm sure it'll surpass 200 000 this this weekend it's one thing to get that money uh, you know the Keir Starmer leadership campaign raised several hundred thousand pounds too it's another thing to get it from ten thousand you know, individual donations. That's what we're looking at, at nine, 10,000. You know, it's going to be north of 10,000 in the next couple of days but by the looks of things. And what that says to you is there are still, you know, huge numbers of people who don't just support Jeremy Corbyn, wouldn't just vote for him, wouldn't just, you know, tweet nice things about him, who will financially back him if he's put into a corner by John Ware, who I don't really have much respect for. Presumably, if I say I don't respect him, presumably he thinks that's libelous. Uh, <laughs> presumably, no, but I'm being, I'm being absolutely serious. If I say John yeah. Ware has John Ware has bad taste in clothes, you know, I might find myself receiving a letter and, and a notice from somebody. You know, and I think, look, if, if Jeremy Corbyn's put in that situation uh, and that many people want to support him, that seems to upset some people because they want him to be utterly destroyed as a human being. And that's not new. You know, that, that was, you know, we heard those words verbatim from members of the Parliamentary Labour Party during the 2016 coup where they wanted to destroy him as a person. Uh, and that's what it boils down to. And the reason being is, you know, he had the temerity not just to be a plucky loser, not just to win and then be subject to a successful coup a few months later. He had the temerity to stay there, God, for five years to see off, you know, to basically go face to face with three Tory leaders, to get a hung parliament. And then, of course, we had the the tragedy of last December. But even that, you know, that was too much. And we can't be allowed to have this again. And so he has to be humiliated, not humbled, humiliated. And humiliated, you know, this doesn't look humiliation. After everything, you know, almost 10,000 people are willing to support him legally. Many of those people, by the way, won't have much cash. I'm sure some will. Many of them won't. And I really think it speaks volumes that just days after the Labour Party made the settlement, giving, you know, six-figure sum to uh, combined to the various quote unquote whistleblowers, but also significant amounts of money to their, their legal team. I think it really speaks volumes that days after doing that in terms of a settlement, Jeremy Corbyn gets this huge outpouring, not just of solidarity and support, uh, but actually people literally putting their money where their mouth is. And I made a sort of offhand comment. I said, look, this goes to show that if Jeremy Corbyn wanted to, he could start a UKIP of the left. He could. Uh, it would be very effective. It would probably get 10% in the general election, wouldn't win any MPs because that's how our electoral system works. Uh, and what it would do is probably push Labour left, like the, the UKIP uh, did with the Tories after 2010. Uh, and it would uh, it would mean they never win a general election ever again. He shouldn't do that, by the way. And I said that, and people go, how dare you? Have you not learned anything? Yeah, I've learned something. In the last 100 years, there have been three splits from the Labour Party. They've all come from the right the left has never split with them. And even, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, after everything, would never dream of doing it. He will always be in a political party, which is the party of organised labour. Uh, and so I have, I've learned a great deal, actually. Jeremy Corbyn has the dignity and the principle to, despite everything, uh, remain in a party replete uh, with uh, people who, quite frankly, haven't got anything resembling scruples or, or values. None at all. I want to get up a tweet which puts in context the sums we're talking about because actually when you're talking about libel 200 grand is not even that much so this is by a mark Asmi, labor activist on twitter also i think he's just finished a law degree so he's written i've seen some people talking about corbyn's salary savings in relation to a crowdfunder defending a libel claim is prohibitively expensive if it goes the full way and you lose you could potentially be liable for half a million pounds so yeah the, i mean the, the sums are big here which is often why when you know un, when people threaten people with libel it doesn't even make it to a judgment because often whoever, you know, if you've got enough money and you threaten someone without much money and say that they've libeled you, et cetera, you can just win the case by default because you're rich. That's why our libel laws are shocking uh, and completely weighted towards the rich. Can I, I, want, can, I, can I reply one more thing? Yep. People are saying, you're absolutely right, half a million pounds. People are saying, oh, he's got so much money. 
You think the guy should lose his house? You think the guy should be homeless because he's being sued by a, a BBC journalist who, by the way, apparently believes in freedom of speech, it, it, but not this, not this freedom of speech. You know, it, it's a very unusual thing for journalists to behave like this. But John Ware, as he outlined in the Jewish Chronicle a few days ago, uh, explained why, you know, apparently it's Twitter trolls who he has to kind of come against. Well, excuse me, Jeremy Corbyn was a former member of the Privy Council. Is that a Twitter troll? No, he, he is still under the, the protocol uh, that informally journalists would have abided by. Uh, which is to basically not uh, proceed with these kinds of cases when people criticize your work as a journalist. We live in a free society. You're allowed to do that. Uh, apparently not. Apparently not. I want to finish the show and the week um, on, you know, I suppose a productive note, because I think there are probably lots of, you know, Labour members who are looking on on all of this kind of in despair. You've got Times columnists sort of saying that what Keir Starmer has to do is, you know, completely embarrass, destroy the left. There are many people egging him on um, to take quite extreme action. These apologies, this idea of, you know, it seems like they've basically, um, you know, thrown Corbyn under a bus when it comes to this, basically saying he was wrong all along, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of people who are despairing. And so I want us to have a very brief conversation about the leverage um, that left-wingers have at this point in time in the Labour Party. Basically, you know, how should people now be, or well not should, how could people, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to tell people what to do, but what 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 routes are available for the left to have influence within the Labour Party and leverage over Keir Starmer? Aaron? You answer that first, because I know you've got strong feelings about this. Yeah, I'll answer it first. Okay, so, I mean, I put it out on Twitter. Results. There were some good suggestions that came back. I sort of put out a tweet saying, I want constructive answers. What leverage should the left have? Now, some people suggested rule changes. I think at this point in time, that's probably a non-starter. I think when it comes to the legal frameworks within the Labour Party, Keir Starmer basically can run the show. Um, a big difference between... I mean, for me, if you look at the Labour Party, what's the most powerful block? It's the PLP. They're the people who you know, can't be pushed aside. They've got a constitutional position for five years in the Houses of in the House of Commons. That's why Corbyn was weak within the party. It's why Kistan was very strong within the party. Um, so people saying get rule changes at conference. I can't see it happening because at the moment the unions are allied with Keir Starmer apart from Unite. There are free elections coming up for the general secretaries of three very big unions. Um, so Unison, Unite and GMB. That could be a game changer. We'll have to see if you're in one of those unions. Maybe you should join one of those unions if you're not um, and vote for a left wing candidate but in general i have also been you know i've heard some strong arguments actually to say that actually the left does have some influence now and they sort of fall under two categories one is if keir starmer were to win um he's not going to have a big majority you know the most likely example is he doesn't even have a majority he has a plurality of votes and he can maybe ally with the smp to get a majority in that situation whilst in opposition, having 30 left-wing MPs can't really do much. If you've got a very slender majority or if you're a minority government, then 30 left-wing MPs can have loads of influence um, within that party. So it should pull a potential Keir Starmer government to the left. Um, and the other argument that's put forward is that the left have the ideas. So what have you seen from Keir Starmer in terms of policy? Nothing. And there is going to be a point in time where they sort of are grasping for what are they actually going to offer to the public. And if you're looking for, you know, where are these ideas going to come from? There are some people in the shadow cabinet, Ed Miliband, for example, who is interested in what the left is saying and wants to have, you know, a more interesting policy prospectus than he went to the electorate with in 2015. So I think ideas, those 30 MPs could have influence after an election. And you could say, I mean, people have said start a new party. My thought there. Um, is that I think without an issue, it's not going to be a serious threat. Although saying that, I kind of take... But what I had said was that it needs a charismatic leader and a crunch issue. And so, for example, Change UK had their crunch issue, which was the Brexit election. They didn't have a charismatic leader, but the media loved them. When it comes to the left, the media won't love them, so they'll need a charismatic leader. My initial thought was maybe Corbyn's not charismatic enough for that. But given that he's you know made 200k in... 48 hours there's obviously still a demand um to have political to have jeremy corbyn as a as a leader of a political movement aaron your turn you know i think the thing about by the way if you could hear whining it's not because somebody's under the floorboards it's because my dog has managed to escape from his pen and is uh, outside my door um <laughs> uh, i agree with them the most leverage they have ironically is if uh, labor gets into power uh, which was the same, of course, for the right if Jeremy Corbyn had won the 2017 general election. You know, actually, in that in that 
in those circumstances, you know, the, 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 the Labour right actually would have had more leverage than ever uh, had they done that. Uh, I would say... I would say I think I think you're right. What's the big difference between now and 1997 is that the left then didn't really exist, either organisationally or in terms of ideas. Blairism was really operating in a policy vacuum, which was why public relations and media uh, was such a substitute for it. You know, policy was driven very much by public relations and media, partly because they wanted good media, partly because there was little else driving it. It wasn't a democratic party. Uh, there was economic growth. The Tories gave them a public surplus. Uh, history was over. The fundamentals of the economy had kind of been agreed for 20 years. So I, I think it's a very different context. And I agree with you. Ideas is the, is the big one. But what I'd say is, is again, like we we had an analysis. We we didn't kid ourselves. We knew that power resided in the in the parliamentary Labour Party. We knew that. We repeatedly said it. And yet the Labour leadership and the Labour NEC did nothing about it for years. And I think one good response to what we're hearing at the moment, oh, we'll vote for a left NEC. We had a left NEC. They adopted the IHRA, which, by the way, I think parts of that absolutely clamped down of, of, of freedom of expression. Uh, they didn't They didn't really put forward any left candidates. You know, what did they do? So, OK, I voted for a left NEC once. What difference is it going to make next time? I will. Uh, but they have to do a hell of a lot better because, to be quite frank, for the last two years, a left-controlled NEC did absolutely sweet FA. Uh, secondly, I think we need to think about what 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 does a 2024 election? Let's say Labour, like you say, get a plurality. Of course, I want them to get. Up, I want Labour to be the next government. I think we need to think of okay, the left needs an extra 10, 15 MPs, charismatic leaders, and it wants it needs to have a policy agenda that it'll push through within a, within a broader coalition. And it's hard for everybody, me included, right now, right, to think about 2024. Uh, but that's ultimately what we've got to do: we've got to pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, build our organisations, and really put yourself in that position, 2024. Uh, because, and I'll be quite frank, if that doesn't happen, you know, Labour. The Labour Party needs the left to win a general election. OK, we just found out in 2019 it needs, it needs the centre too, right? But it needs the left. It, ha it needs the left. It can't get rid of it. It can't expunge the left, right? As we're seeing with this kind of outpouring towards Jeremy Corbyn. If, if those people don't turn up, don't knock on doors, if they're actively diminishing the party, they have zero chance. And so there's huge amounts of leverage on the left right now. And I think, you know, part of the sort of media onslaught is precisely to kind of mystify that and obscure it. But there really is. Uh, but we need, I think, fundamentally to have our eyes on 2024, getting good people in, charismatic people, leadership. It can't be ignored as an idea. Something Corbynism did, one big failure of Corbynism was to think that leadership doesn't really exist. It does exist. It's critical. Uh, and also to have that policy agenda as part of a as part of a coalition in government. And to have a strong alternative media, um, which is the cue to go to navarromedia.com forward slash support and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. Um, I don't know. I'm personally very glad that, you know, Navarro Media has grown since um, Jeremy Corbyn, you know, left the leadership of the Labour Party. I don't think that's because he left the leadership of the Labour Party, but, you know, that people were worried, oh, what's going to happen to all the alternative media now that Jeremy Corbyn's gone? Oh, it's going to all just collapse and go back into, you know, crawl back into the hole from which it came. Um, if you're a kind of centrist columnist, that's the kind of language you use. But no, actually, I think we're getting bigger and better. And that's because of your support. Um, if you gave us a super chat this evening, thank you very much. If not, please do go to navarromedia.com forward slash support. Um, donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month or give us a bonus. We Can appreciate I bump in, you make us possible. Yes, Aaron. Could you hear my dog, by the way? Yes. Oh, quietly, I'm not, ha, quite, I wanted okay. to see the guy. Oh, I'd say I'd so let him cute. in. Yeah, I'd let him in. Should I let him in or is that just... Yeah, go on. Like, Fox. Okay, Fox. You go back to Michael for a second. You can wax lyrical. I'll get Gina. Uh, if, if, if you like dog pics, you should follow Aaron Bastani on Instagram because that's now... He's, he's just like dog content. Um, obviously... <laughs> While the doc comes back, I'll tell you the the basics, which is that we're obviously going to be back on Monday at 8 p.m. That'll be me, Aaron, and Ash Sarkar. Here's the dog. He's so oh. fucking cute. Uh, Gino. Oh. Gino. Gino. So cute. All right. Um, it's been a pleasure as always. Uh, thank you for watching Tisky Sour on Navara. Media will be back on Monday at 8 p.m. Good night.